respected chair, uh, panelists, and uh, dear participants, uh, a very warm uh, welcome to you uh, to this session. Uh, on behalf of SANEM, uh, I am Saima Hog Bidisha, Research Director of SANEM. Uh, I am welcoming you to, the, uh, to this session, Trade and Value Chain of the Bay of Bengal Economic Dialogue 2021. Uh, now, it's a great pleasure of ours that uh, in today's session, we have Dr. Uh, Ganeshan Vignaraja. Uh, he's the Senior Visiting Fellow of Pathfinder Foundation, Colombo, as the chair. Uh, special remarks will be provided by Dr. Tadatedu Hayasi, uh, OIC and Unit Head, Sazek, uh, ADB. Uh, we also have a very rich uh, panel of uh, distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, we have Dr. Raj Rajan Ratna, who is the Economic Affairs Officer, UNS Cup Delhi. Uh, we have Dr. Fahmida Khadun, Executive Director, CPD Dhaka. We have Dr. Uh, Saika Sinha Roy, Professor uh, of Economic, Jadavpur University, uh, uh, India. We have uh, Ms. Shubhashini Abesinghe, uh, who is the research director, Verity Research Colombo. We have Mr. Uh, Afak Hussein, director, Brief Delhi. So uh, very welcome uh, to you from Sanem. Uh, before we start our session, a few of the housekeeping rules. Uh, first of all, uh, I would request uh, the distinguished panelists to keep their video on, uh, but uh, other participants are requested, kindly requested to mute their audio and to turn off their video during the session. Uh, and if you have questions, kindly either raise, uh, use the raise hand option or use the chat box uh, to uh, ask the question. And uh, kindly, it would be good if you could uh, just mention to whom you are, uh, your question is directed. And if you could just uh, uh, mention your name and designation. Uh, the chair will uh, collect the uh, questions and read out the question. And you will be able to uh, make comments if you have any. Uh, so uh, I think uh, we are all set for this session. So over to you, Honorable Chair. Thank you very much, and I'm very grateful to the organizers for having me here. Um, as we all know, uh, 2020 uh, was a year of scarring of world trade, where we saw something unprecedented uh, on the scale of perhaps the Great Depression, certainly much worse than the global financial crisis of 2008-2009. Now, as we are in February 2021, there are a couple of encouraging signs uh, for uh, trade, which set the scene for this session. The first is we have an improving outlook for uh, trade. So the IMF uh, World Economic Outlook, which was released a few days ago, uh, projects a rebound in global trade, uh, along with a, a, a sort of a rebound in, in global growth. Uh, the volume of trade for developing and emerging markets is expected to grow at some 9% uh, this year, uh, up from negative growth of some 8 odd percent last year um, due to the COVID crisis. Um, now, developing economies trade growth is expected to outpace that of developed countries, but developed countries are also expected to be uh, in quite high uh, single digit uh, figures. The second uh, trend is that uh, South Asia, East Asia trade is likely to be a bright spot in this uh, recovery. And one would expect uh, in this kind of recovery, a rapid trade growth in India uh, on the back of its uh, very rapid projected growth, uh, continued rapid growth in China because it was the only country in Asia, one of the few that was in positive growth uh, last year, uh, and Asia and as economies come back from this crisis. Uh, but it's all very unclear of, of what this type of outlook really means for uh, the Bay of Bengal subregion and the countries within it uh, amidst this kind of very high global uh, and regional uncertainty. Um, you know, we, we are worried about trade tensions. We're worried about when the vaccines are available to release countries from the pandemic and so on. There are many uncertainties. Um, so the really big questions for today's session are, uh, what is the possible outlook for trade and regional value chains in the Bay of Bengal? Second, what are the main obstacles uh, to trade growth and regional value chains in this kind of unique sub-region which connects uh, some South Asian countries 
and some Southeast Asian countries. Um, and the third question is perhaps the most important one is what should be done um, both at the national and the sub-regional level to foster this kind of nascent trade recovery? Now we have a wonderful uh, panel to answer these questions and they have already been introduced. Um, so I'm not going to do that right now, um, but can I just request all our panelists to uh, try to keep their remarks for seven minutes or so. So we would have about 30 minutes for questions and answers uh, and a summary. Um, and audience, please uh, do put your uh, questions in the chat box or another way. Uh, so we have special remarks from Tadateru Hayashi uh, from the Asian Development Bank. Tadateru, over to you for, for no, no more than 10 minutes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Distinguished chair and panelists of the forum, SANEM organizers, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. On behalf of ADB, let me express appreciation to SANEM for the opportunity to address this session on trade and regional value chains. ADB has been supporting regional cooperation and in integration efforts among BIMSTEC member countries through the South Asia Sub-Regional Economic Program called SASEC, which covers Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Myanmar, Nepal, and Sri Lanka, and also by the Greater Mekong Sub-Region Economic Cooperation Program, GMS, which covers Myanmar and Thailand, among others. A common thread in both programs is the adoption of pro pragmatic project-based results-oriented approach focusing on enhancing connectivity and competitiveness of the member countries. SASEC program launched its vision document by SASEC Finance Minister's meeting in 2017. The vision aims to transform the sub-region into growth engine by generating synergies from leveraging its source resources industry and gateways and hubs. Under the vision document, SASEC program focused on its operational priorities in transport, trade facilitation, and energy sectors. SASEC operational plan under the vision document identified six SASEC corridors so that investment will be focused on potential areas and coordinated to ensure synergies among projects. Cooperation in transport sector promoted connectivity of national transport systems in roads, railways, maritime and air, enabling the seamless movement of people and goods. Trade facilitation complement transport investments through measures that reduce bottleneck at the borders. Projects and programs focused on modernizing and harmonizing customs operations and improving border facilities. Introduction of technology such as electronic cargo tracking system was supported uh, to facilitate transit cargo by reducing the need for customs inspection. SASEC has also helped its member countries to negotiate motor vehicle agreements to create seamless flow of passengers and cargo traffic between the countries. Improvements in energy trade infrastructure have focused on enhancing national energy security while building bilateral and regional arrangements to promote cross-border interconnection and electricity trade. Power trade is seen as an instrument to increase energy access, ease supply constraints, promote clean energy, and raise the level of energy security in the sub-region. Apart from SASEC, ADB has been assisting the BIMSTEC in responding to the call of BIMSTEC leaders at their Goa retreat in October 2016. ADB has been supporting the preparation of the master plan on connectivity. The draft master plan was presented to the third meeting of the BIMSTEC Transport Connectivity Working Group in December 2020. Upon endorsement at the BIMSTEC Summit, the master plan will guide the implementation of policies, programs, and projects 
for connectivity with multimodal transport linkages between South and Southeast East Asia. Ongoing ADB technical assistance to BIMSTEC started in 2019 is supporting three analytical studies on transport connectivity financing, trade facilitation, and tourism promotion, as well as knowledge sharing and capacity development of the Secretariat and the member states. Coming back to SASEC program, the SASEC operational plan emphasized economic corridor development as a new strategic area of cooperation. It would be seen as an evolution of SASEC strategy from previous focus on infrastructure development to more direct intervention for private sector development. This change has been taken in the backdrop of economic structural transformation that many South Asian countries are reaching middle-income country status and larger share in GDP and labor composition are shifting from agriculture to industry or services. Nevertheless, share of intra-regional trade remains low, indicating that the countries are not realizing benefit from comparative advantage within the sub-region. ADB supported economic corridor studies in India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, and has been identified opportunities for economic growth. In India, the initial focus was on the East Coast through its Visakhapatnam Chennai Industrial Corridor program. ADB then prepared a vision study to develop Assam state as India's expressway to ASEAN. It was followed by a scaled up study on Northeast region, which is the pivot for India's Act East policy to develop connectivity between South and Southeast Asia. The Northeast Economic Corridor study covered the states of Assam, Manipur, Meghalaya, Mizoram, Nagaland, Sikkim, and Tripura, taking a cluster approach for industrial development that enables firms to use common resource efficiently, generating externalities of lower costs and more innovation. The study identifies two kinds of clusters, growth centers and border centers. While growth centers serve as hubs for industrialization and urbanization, border centers have the potential to function as trade enablers for industries in the region. The overall study framework builds around the core multimodal transport network that connects the industrial cluster to gateways at three levels, within Northeast region, between Northeast region and the, the rest of India, and between Northeast region and the neighboring countries of Bangladesh and Myanmar. To facilitate trade, the industrial clusters at the border will be supplemented with border trade infrastructure and regulatory measures. Similarly, to promote industrial clusters, streamlining existing policies, identifying new policy incentives, and strengthening the regulatory framework are as critical as physical infrastructure. Focus sectors products covered by the study include agriculture and food processing, such as coffee, spices, and fruits, bamboo, tourism, medical tourism, oil and gas, cement, and rubber. The study has mapped the potential opportunities and challenges of the development of production clusters of these products. Simultaneously, the study has mapped their potential market, conducted value chain analysis, and studied cross-border synergies to ensure their efficient evacuation to gateways. The rapid expansion of COVID-19 pandemic has made most countries realize the need for collective action to arrest its further spread while minimizing the disruption to cross-border flow of goods. ADB's regional cooperation programs, such as SASEC and GMS, are seen as platforms to undertaking short, medium and long-term options to address the new challenge. 
In SASEC, we are exploring trade facilitation measures to expedite the movement of critical goods and to minimize supply chain disruptions. ADB, as the SASEC Secretariat, supports member countries to facilitate efficient cross-border logistics for COVID-19 vaccines. We are also looking into supply chain mapping of essential health sector commodities. The exercise will enhance visibility of import sources and product markets, thus inform both national and corporate level decisions on supply dependence and make the supply chain resilient. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, ADB is committed to support trade facilitation efforts in the BIMSTEC region as part of our commitment for enhancing regional cooperation and integration. We recognize BIMSTEC as potential for growth being the main link of, for South and Southeast Asia economic integration. In conclusion, I hope this workshop will help us navigate our regional integration path in the post-COVID-19 world. We are open for future support for BIMSTEC region in trade and regional value chains. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Tadateru. So you talked a lot about uh, sub-regional cooperation and this uh, nexus of programs, the GMS, the SASEC, um, and then the various uh, bits of support you do under that transport, trade facilitation, energy, and so on. Uh, very useful in setting a canvas. Um, uh, Ratna, please, uh, you have the floor. Seven minutes, if you can manage it, would be fabulous. Thank you. I will, I will do. Thank you very much. And since you set the tone, it's very easy to answer to those three responses. Uh, but yeah, first of all, let me uh, thank uh, Sanim and other organizers for giving me this opportunity to share uh, our thoughts um, and the chair and moderator uh, Ganeshan, whom I know for long, reading a lot of his papers. So uh, pardon me if you find certain things which I said you have, you may have said already. But uh, you know, we all know in this part of the world, uh, regional integration, regional cooperation is a big challenge. Uh, talking to, uh, you know, Bay of Bengal initiative, the first thing which comes to mind is BIMSTEC, and which at one point of time was the fastest growing regional uh, grouping. Unfortunately, it has gone into lull. Uh, and uh, the negotiations which should have been concluded uh, ages ago on comprehensive agreement and FTA uh, has run into a problem. And I, I was part of the negotiation, so I know we were at the verge of uh, finalizing it in way back in 2006 and then some level of ambitions and some political alignment here and there derailed the process and once it derails it is gone now uh, as uh, uh, the chair said uh, this is a bridging link between south asia and southeast asia and the countries uh, were very keen uh, to get engaged into this uh, definitely there are many obstacles and uh, uh, the possible uh, uh, outlooks or the solutions I will just highlight given my uh, time, which I have uh, or being allotted to me. So I will just highlight uh, uh, some of the points um, and already uh, highlighted in, 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 in one of these uh, interventions by uh, Mr. Tara Teru, uh, or talking about trade facilitation. Um, uh, you know, when there was a global economic recession way back in 2008, it was China and India which was growing, imports were growing, and so the entire region of Asia and Pacific did not suffer as the rest of the world. But this COVID pandemic has uh, uh, really uh, made uh, each country uh, see that there is a slowdown in their economy. Uh, many of the export orders have been cancelled. Um, the supply chains have been disrupted. And these are all mainly because of the countries which in, in, in at that moment of time, because there were not much information, they closed their borders, they shut down their borders, even for their neighboring countries. Um, and that had uh, really uh, disrupted a lot of supply chain, dependence, unemployment, rising poverty. In fact, UNSCAP has come out with uh, two uh, very important papers in this regard as to how to build back better and the national responses and sub-regional responses. For this uh, Bay of Bengal, there are two issues which are important uh, for the supply chain. One, 
the cost of trade among the country is still very high. The, uh, they, they are, uh, they are um, um, neighbors, so they, are, they have very uh, geographical advantage, but still if you see the trade cost between them, it's much higher than what these countries are trading with other countries. And if you compare with ASEAN, definitely it's much, much higher. Now, to reduce these trade costs, there are many policy issues, but there are also infrastructural issues and has been hinted by my colleague from ADB. But this is important that uh, cross-border connectivity issues, and it's not only linked to energy, but uh, you know, um, building the freight corridors, uh, uh, we are talking about Bay of Bengal, so having a shipping line connectivity, railway connectivity. There we have a study which said that if you are, uh, you know, uh, transporting goods through railway, the cost is much lesser than when you are doing it by any other mode of transportation. Uh, then the issue comes is that of a digital divide within the subregion. The countries of having ICT connectivity, digital connectivity, the know-how. And uh, actually, uh, there is a very interesting uh, debate which is going on as to how uh, the digital divide is also bringing in inequality within the country and among the countries, between the haves and have nots. And any trade facilitation major when you are talking about, without meeting uh, these digital divide, making it paperless, which is more sustainable environment, uh, 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 you know, electronic mode of communication, uh, cooperation among the customs would be several issues which will lead to reducing the trade cost and uh, the infrastructure bottlenecks at the bottom. Uh, then, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the issue comes is um, uh, on addressing the non-tariff barriers, non-tariff measures, uh, even within the countries. And if you will see the trade pattern, I will not say uh, or go into those details because the time is very short. But most of the countries in Bay of Bengal, they are trading with the developed world. They are exporting to US, they are exporting to EU, uh, but still uh, there are aberrations when they want to trade among the neighboring countries. And there are a lot of non-tariff measures which are creating these conflicts. And so uh, the, the, the issue would be how to build those confidence measures. Um, you know, unfortunately, I looked at, uh, uh, just for my own academic uh, interest, looking at many of these regional groupings and how they the country is behaved. You know, first three to four months, at, um, unfortunately, um, the regional groupings were not very successful in bringing the countries uh, to talk at a sub-regional level as to how to, you know, address the pandemic, the, the technology, the know-how, the experiences, how to even control the pandemic spread in a particular country. And everybody, every country took, uh, you know, the borders were closed, no movement of the people, even, I mean, for local hearts across the borders. I mean, it was happening informally and other things, but that was a platform. And I looked at, it took a time lag of three to four months. Countries started talking in March and April. And so the SARC fund was, uh, you know, uh, fund was created. ASEAN started talking. The countries started talking with China, though ASEAN was a fulcrum had FTA with China, a lot of economic cooperation, perhaps it could have been started at a, uh, at a beginning of learning these experiences from other countries as to how we can uh, stop. And, uh, and uh, unfortunately, I looked at Binstech. There is a cooperation area for public health. And the meeting was held, if you go on the website and look at decades ago. Now, I mean, uh, I'm not passing a value judgment, but this is an opportunity lost. In the crisis situation, if countries cannot uh, be collective in responding to global pandemic. Uh, when business as usual comes, there is a complacency, then there won't be much of a need. So this could come out to be an opportunity for a greater regional cooperation among the countries. Looking into the supply chains and uh, other possible areas, this is also a problem because many of the sectors, yes. Can you just wrap up, please? Thank you. I so will much. just take 30 seconds. I have put a stop watch. I have 30 seconds, if you can permit me. Yes, uh, because they are competing. And in the FTA, when you talk about the problem is many countries are desirous of seeking the market access, but not looking for integration. So many countries try to uh, stop their giving their market access. And that is the problem in the BIMSTEC, like SAF, SAFTA. 
Well, if you look at the number of items are less, but highly traded items are in the negative list and sensitive list. So if that happens, then you cannot talk about a regional integration. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ganesh. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, so that uh, provided some really useful insights of the costs of trade and the NTBs and these uh, sensitive lists uh, that uh, may be there in the FTA discussion. Very, very useful. Thank you so much. Uh, now we have uh, Dr. Famida uh, Katun. Uh, Dr. Famida, seven minutes, please, if you don't mind. Thank you. Do, do we have uh, Dr. Famida? Uh, yes, yeah, oh, sorry. yes, I was uh, okay, thank muted, sir. Thank, um, thank you, Chair. And I also like to thank um, Sanim for organizing this very important um, you know, uh, uh, two, three days long uh, seminar and webinar um, on Bay of Bengal region. Uh, so within my, uh, you know, seven minutes, I would like to focus on a few issues, I think, which have already been touched upon my, by my previous speakers. But uh, let me just, you know, try to highlight uh, and uh, you know, reiterate some of those. Um, so, as uh, has been you know, mentioned in, in also earlier uh, sessions uh, I was watching, uh, the economic and geopolitical importance of the Bay of Bengal region has been highlighted, and we all know, and uh, this has been discussed in detail earlier also. Now, I would like to focus on the you know, um, emerging and likely trends, which the chair has you know, posed a few questions, but this will be related to that, those also, that the trends in the regional value chain and also trade in the context of COVID-19 pandemic, because it has changed uh, every aspects of our lives and it will continue to do so uh, you know, in the coming years. And before pandemic, we were also observing a changing pattern of globalization and also the global production system uh, because of various national and global policies. And also the, one of the you know, important factors was the technological disruption. And COVID-19 has expedited that process. Various studies have indicated that you know, what is the new reality and how the global economy is moving towards actually looking forward to regional levels. And it is also looking for a shorter value chain, which will be more efficient. Um, in fact, uh, if you, uh, you, know, you all know that you know, uh, in uh, 2020, uh, the UNCTAD report on world investment that had highlighted some of the changes which will be observed in case of the global value chain and also in case of cross-border investment and physical assets. In fact, um, that report had mentioned that the process has already started to slow down in the, in the, in the decades of 2010. Now with the pandemic interruption, interrupting our lives and economies, there'll be further transformation and um, in the whole international production system. And uh, so there is a, you know, there, it is being discussed and you know, apprehended also that there, you know, the way the globalization is you know, heading towards, there might be a reversal. I mean, we are already observing many obstacles, bottlenecks towards globalization. Uh, and um, there is a, also, the, as a result of this, the, there might be a you know, reduction or downsizing of the international whole production system. So um, the reasons for disruption, and also these are related to policy interventions for at the country level. One of the uh, reasons, as I have mentioned earlier, is the technological progress, you know, the digitization, uh, artificial intelligence, those have really changed the pattern or process of production. So that had impact across the economy and society also. The other one, the protectionist policies, which have been highlighted by previous speakers, in case of trade investment, and we have seen the multilateral organizations such as WTO, how they are, have become defunct, uh, defunct and uh, or as opposed to that, we are also observing that at the country level or at the multi-country or multi-regional trade agreements which are you know, coming in. So, uh, however, 
many countries, the smaller ones, um, you know, mostly they are lagging behind. They are not part of those, uh, you know, multi-region or multi-country trade agreements. And the third issue is also why countries are, you know, facing bottlenecks. Third issue is the issue of sustainability. Because as we know, as we do trade, um, so the emphasis on green trade, green production, these are all very good, but they're also, you know, act sometimes as, uh, you know, trade barriers. Now, uh, how to, you know, stay alive during this new reality, uh, of, as has been highlighted that, you know, the uh, in the need for investment or export diversification, this is very important because you know some of the regions, uh, most of the region, most of the countries within the region, within the Bengal region, they have you know very few production or export concentration. For example, Bangladesh is mainly focused on ready-made garments uh, export. So a single product is dominating the whole export basket. You know, so is uh, the case with other countries. So diversification is very important for resilience. Uh, uh, in fact, though we have survived somehow during this COVID, but we haven't, you know, as uh, has been mentioned that uh, my earlier speaker also mentioned that during this you know, COVID, we have seen that uh, many uh, orders have been canceled in case of Bangladesh, orders have been canceled in case of the textiles exports and or postponed. So that has been a real challenge. Um, and also the you know, creation of industrial structure at the regional level, that is one important uh, strategy that can be. And of course, you know, related to the sustainability is that more investment in, in, in green, uh, you know, uh, aspect, green areas, green and blue investment, in fact, are needed. And during every crisis, if, you know, in 2008-9 financial crisis also, there have been more emphasis on green investment. So this is another opportunity to make green investment, which also means that countries which are not making investment in these in green, uh, green areas, they might also face uh, you know, more challenges in terms of making uh, exports or you know, increasing, the, increasing their trade. So um, this re-emphasizes the fact that there's a need for more collaboration. Uh, more, there's a need to uh, the need for the region to come together uh, in case of you know maintaining uh, the maintaining and increasing the regional uh, demands for products. So, but however, one of the important uh, you know areas, other areas uh, to among other areas, one of the important areas is the uh, work on um, small entrepreneurs, because uh, in case of in particularly in case of Bangladesh and I'm sure in other countries also. The SMEs, the small and medium enterprises, are, are important sources of employment, and which we have seen that during COVID-19, um, these were the sectors uh, which had been hit the hardest. And also, despite the stimulus packages which have been announced by governments, these you know these entrepreneurs faced uh, severe challenges, serious challenges in accessing the, uh, the funds which have been allocated for them. And that's why the disbursement is low and they are yet to recover, you know, I mean, even the larger uh, you know, entrepreneurs are, have not recovered, but the smaller ones are at more disadvantageous situations. So, and in terms of the market access, again, these are the, you know, if these, uh, entrepreneur, the small entrepreneurs, if they can be linked with the market, uh, that will also boost trade, not only trade, but also employment and income. Uh, however, as has been mentioned by my previous speaker, that uh, non tariff barriers have been uh, one of the important barriers uh, for uh, accessing markets. Uh, this is true for also for the larger entrepreneurs, but the smaller for the smaller entrepreneurs, this is even more uh, an important predicament. So, um, uh, and uh, on the other hand, I would like to end by saying that as we are observing that um, now uh, countries are coming together for economic partnership, mega, you know, uh, you know, uh, partnership cooperation agreement, uh, as some of the countries are lagging behind. They are also, you know, um, 
keen to take part. However, there's a also need for improving the efficiency uh, and uh, skills and prepare themselves. So, which means that there are uh, there is a need for the you know for the governments, the respective governments, for policy interventions, for reforms. Uh, in in certain areas, so that they can you know they can take part in these um, uh, economic partnership. Otherwise, there's a there's a danger or there's a risk of lagging behind further in terms of taking part in the you know in um, regional as well as global uh, trade. I think I would uh, stop here. My time is almost up. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity. Thank you, uh, Doctor. Amida, you brought out, I think, some interesting new dimensions. You talked about uh, the technological disruptions of these disruptive technologies. Uh, you talked about protectionism, uh, which was also mentioned uh, before with these mega FTAs and the risk of countries being left out, uh, the greening uh, of things, and that can also act as a, as a barrier, but also an opportunity. And you talked about the SMEs and the SME finance. Uh, so you gave us much more material. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Shaukat, uh, please, you have the floor. If you could in seven minutes, that would be fabulous. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ganesh and Vigna uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity. I thank Sanim and uh, Dr. Selim Rehan for inviting me. Uh, now, let me start with characterizing the COVID situation. Where lies the key to post-COVID recovery? The COVID situation cannot be uh, uh, talked about. COVID and related lockdown situation cannot be uh, linked to a cr uh, economic crisis that led to the economic crisis cannot be a typical Keynesian situation. There is demand constraint though. But along with demand constraint, there was a, a rapid decline and there was almost uh, nil supply, the entire supply chain got disrupted. So uh, there was a demand shock as well as a supply shock. The supply shock will change with ease, easing the uh, supply as the lockdown in countries after countries are lifted, but demand will take time to resume. Now, in most of these Asian countries, to which the um, BIMSTEC countries belong to, ADB calculations would show that demand mostly comes from within the economy. But post-COVID recovery, if uh, one says that demand from within the economy takes time to uh, resume, trade becomes the most viable way to boost demand and boost growth in all these economies. Even if trade is growing in this region, was found to be growing before COVID in this region, uh, intra-regional trade was, however, low. Regional value chains, more than global value chains, actually usually play a very important role in trade growth, and that had happened in the developed countries. But unfortunately, in the BIMSTEC region, regional value chains did not play a significant role, nor did the global value chain. The, there was a poor connect, both in terms of the regional value chain and the global value chain. Uh, so for BIMSTEC, RVCs are not prominent. Even GVCs are also not prominent. So trade cannot grow post-pandemic unless there is a revival in demand, both global demand as well as regional demand. Even if we take that supply disruptions have, have gone away and supply side uh, is fully functioning. So demand uh, has to be given prime importance. Now, where would this demand come from? It has to come from within each economy and that would take some time to grow. Now, in the meantime, what, where are the other constraints that these BIMSTEC economies face? 
this beam, beam stick economies, because we have already said that the regional value chains, uh, the connectivity in terms of regional value chains, uh, the share, it, it's very low. So there is need to link up this uh, beam stick countries, the Bay of Bengal countries uh, to the regional value chains. And in the process, what is important that big corporations within the region need to link up through FDI and technology, leading to some kind of economic restructuring and connect to the small and medium enterprises, which are predominant in the region, so that these small and medium enterprises get regionally as well as uh, globally co connected later on. Uh, now, in this way, uh, there can one way to bring in FDI and bring in technology into this region is to set up SEZs. SEZs can be, though there are downside risks of SEZs, but SEZs can be one way out. Uh, now, which are the sectors which this um, uh, which these uh, economies need to be? Uh, talk about and I've highlighted some sectors, but there might be many. The first sector, which I think, which can be regionally linked, is the automotive sector. Uh, the second is electronics and electrical equipments. Third is telecommunication equipments. Fourth is textile, including ready-made garments. Fifth is leather and leather apparel and six is gems and jewelry and here i don't mention about agriculture because why i don't mention about agriculture because uh, we have seen post pandemic most of the countries have revived in trade and as imf says that there is immense potential for trade to grow in the coming months and the coming year uh, and agriculture can be one viable way um, to promote trade growth, but there is lesser scope for value addition in agriculture than in other manufacturing industries. So uh, the regional value chains that need to be developed uh, 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 more strongly include automotive, sector, electronics and electronic, electrical equipments, telecommunication, textile, leather, and gems and jewelry. So how one goes about doing that and the constraints really lie in that we have not gone far in terms of regional trade liberalization. So regional trade liberalization within the bin state, we have done liberalization multilaterally we have done liberalization unilaterally, but for the BIMSTEC region, there might be bilateral FTA agreements between like Indo Sri Lanka, Indo Thailand, and other countries as well. But could you please, uh, Shaukat, could you please wrap up? Because I yes, want to I'm give just, you. I'm just, I'm just wrapping up. So, the, the, um, regional trade liberalization and trade facilitation can be one way. And this I reiterate the point on um, infrastructure. Then can be a common facility infrastructure, like a deep sea port in the Bay of Bengal region, which can be a common facility in the common waters, and which all countries can take part to build it, and then you can use it um, for their trade growth. The other thing that needs to be picked up is ICT automation and uh, artificial intelligence, which has become more important in the post-COVID time. And finally, before I end, I would request the BIMSTEC Secretariat to provide regional value chain data, which is scanty for the region, so that there is some meaningful analysis and way forward in terms of uh, policy making. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Akut. So you brought to this uh, conversation uh, the really important issue about demand and supply shocks, and you emphasize that demand has to revive. Uh, you brought in SEZs uh, as a common facility and also these uh, big seaports, which I thought was very interesting. 
Uh, and then you brought in within that this question of sectors and this whole question of sector targeting, which I guess we may come to in the chat. Um, and then you lastly talked about data. Uh, thank you. That was really very useful. Uh, Shubhashini, uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Dr. Vigdaraja. And thank you very much for the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Um, I will uh, discuss uh, supply chains, regional value chains, especially the Asian value chains. I think um, like uh, mentioned, it was mentioned by a previous speaker, uh, the Bay of Bengal countries, especially Beamstack countries, maybe other than Thailand, missed the opportunity of being part of regional value chains. And that's a big opportunity missed by most of our countries. Uh, when the production networks were created. And uh, these, these production networks started somewhere up towards end of 20th century. And some of the research indicated by around 2010, 2012, actually most of these production networks and regional value chains in Asia were stabilizing. That means there were no new networks were being created, which means actually there weren't many opportunities available for newcomers or even countries like Sri Lanka to plug into. When I spoke to one of the apparel, big apparel companies in Sri Lanka, what they said, one of the senior officials, what they said is, look, you know, if we want to be part of even some of the production networks, now they have stabilized to an extent, we have to uh, get somebody to plug out of the existing supply chain for us to plug in because they're not creating new production networks anymore. But I think after the pandemic, there, there might be a new opportunity for Bay of Bengal countries, even though there is unlikely to be regional value chains created among them, but to be part of the production networks, making use of the opportunity that the pandemic is created in terms of restructuring these value chains. So there is a lot of discussion about whether the pandemic and also there was discussion about the US-China tensions uh, arising, leading to a certain degree of diversion uh, and seeking new uh, sourcing and production destinations by the existing buyers. So the question to ask for Bay of Bengal countries to me is, like, especially countries like Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, India, uh, is to, and others, is to see, does this offer an opportunity? Because uh, the, the major buyers or the multinational corporations may be thinking of restructuring their uh, existing production networks to make them more resilient, more agile, and more able to withstand similar shocks uh, in the future. So in this discussion, you see three, at least I have seen three strands of thought. One which says, actually the companies may be looking at ways to reduce the distance between uh, suppliers of different components. So that is as a way of um, uh, making the uh, supply chains more resilient. Then there is the second strand that says not only that, there may be a tendency to actually bring producers closer to markets reshoring kind of discussion. Then there is the third way, which says actually, uh, most of us Asian supply chains have been very closely linked to China and the US-China tensions or the tensions with US and um, the China and the West, is it creating this desire for the companies to reduce the reliance on China? Of course, it's not possible uh, to, to substitute uh, a, a producer like uh, or a supplier like China with any other country, but a certain degree of diversion of production and sourcing is to happen. And we know it's already happening. And we know some of the countries like Vietnam, Bangladesh, Cambodia have been benefiting from this kind of uh, diversion of sourcing and production decisions. So, so this, offers, this, this offers a new opportunity uh, for countries in the region to think, can we now uh, maybe look at the, this opportunity and, and make use of this opportunity? And in this context, I agree two of the main constraints that prevented uh, most of the countries in South Asia actually from being integrated into the, into the uh, regional supply chains in my view is I agree with Rajan and others, uh, trade facilitation. You must have very efficient, effective borders that allows you to bring in and out the goods because uh, Asian supply chains are a lot more complex than even the European or the North American supply chains, it is said that actually a component will cross borders multiple times 
in the Asian uh, networks, which means you must have very efficient, uh, low cost, uh, predictable uh, borders to be able to become partners of it. And we know in South Asia, at least I know in Sri Lanka, we lag far behind in terms of automation, digitization of our border agencies and procedures, and there is a lot of catching up to do. The other one is investment framework. Supply chains are driven by investments, foreign investments by big firms as well, large firms. But unfortunately, most of our countries don't have very good investment frameworks that allows foreign investors or even local investors to actually uh, you know, the, the business environment is not conducive for investments. We have high red tape, corruption, uh, uh, there are a lot of complex processes, procedures that, that discourages investors from coming in. And, and this in this area of Sri Lanka has been particularly, uh, has a very poor track record of uh, being able to get uh, investments. So I think but the, if these two problems are very critical to be tackled, if we want to really make use of this second opportunity that may be created because of the pandemic and the potential restructuring of production networks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Vignaraja, over to you. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Subhashini. So you, you brought in uh, yet another dimension to this conversation. Uh, which is really about the opportunities for restructuring these value chains. And you talked about these three uh, strategies uh, by multinationals, uh, which include you know, the reshoring argument, the decrease in the distance between suppliers, and also this uh, decreasing reliance on China. And uh, you mentioned in particular uh, this importance of trade facilitation and, and, and also stable and predictable investment framework. So that was very useful uh, for making these chains shift. Uh, now we have our final speaker, uh, Afak, uh, please uh, go ahead, Afak. Thank you, Dr. Ganeshan. And uh, thank you, Senem and uh, the other organizers for giving me an opportunity to speak uh, alongside such eminent speakers. Uh, I think uh, when we talk of regional cooperation, it could be any, any region. We need to uh, create an ecosystem. We need to create an atmosphere where the cost of non-cooperation is higher so, so that we can force, the countries are forced to cooperate. I mean, if we, have, we have seen in South Asia, it, there couldn't have been a better geographic, geography for the countries uh, to cooperate, to trade with each other. But unfortunately, we never crossed 5%, 6% of uh, regional trade. So, so, with, so how do we achieve this higher cost of non-cooperation? We, we start with trade, then we go forward with investment. And that is what will be the basis of developing a regional value chain within a particular region. So we need to start with trade and then follow it up with investment. So that's the protocol that we, we should follow. But, but how do we, it's, it's, it's very easier said than done. What, why couldn't we do it in South Asia or other regions? It's because we don't have, um, I would like to answer the questions that the chair put out right up front. The challenges, why couldn't we do it in, in one region or what are the challenges that we are facing? It is the ecosystem for cooperation that is missing. So there are three pillars of this ecosystem. One is the infrastructure for logistics, which we call connectivity where ADB is doing phenomenal work. To, to build that connectivity. And connectivity is both hard infrastructure as well as digital infrastructure. And, and, and the next one is the policy framework, which we call the non-tariff barriers and which Rajan already spoke about a bit. There are a, a significant non-tariff barriers which exist. So I'll focus more on connectivity infrastructure and, and trade facilitation, since that is my area of work. So, so when we talk of hard infrastructure, we have maritime infrastructure, we have road infrastructure. And when we look at BIMSTEC, more than 50%, more than 60% of trade is going to happen through road infrastructure, given the, given the location, given the geographies. And, and what do we have? Where do we like? We like and we, we, we are missing out on infrastructure at our cross border. For example, India, Bangladesh, one of the most busiest uh, ICP we have in Petropol, Benapol. Uh, the problems are there. Just an example, 15 days for a truck to cross over. Uh, we're, we're nowhere closer to inter international standards. 
we look at Kolkata port, which is a major port handling land blocked countries like Nepal. We have a waiting period of 15, 20 days for a truck, for a container to be cleared still. And the congestions that exists on both these ports. So there is a lot of work in terms of infrastructure of our roadways and maritime uh, that, is, that is required. Coming to the digital infrastructure, I see three challenges in digital infrastructure. Thanks to COVID, I mean, something to thank COVID for, that we have been forced to move into the digital form of working. Before COVID, we had digital infrastructure available, but still we had hard copies being used parallelly. I, I, I can give you tens of processes where everything is available in digital mode, but we still were asking for hard copies from our exporters and importers and their agents. So, so, what, so I, I, I feel that post COVID, at least this help has been done, that we are forcing our ecosystem to be paperless. But I see three key challenges in digitization. One is the shortcomings in our digital platforms, the glitches, the technical glitches, and some key features. Suddenly you'll feel, oh, this feature is missing in this platform. And that platform goes for a toss. So the platform is there, but some key feature is missing in it. So we, we, it, it, it is not giving its full utilization. The, the second one is the lack of con connectivity within the systems. If there is one system of customs, it doesn't talk to the system of port. As an example, from Indian, Indian trade ecosystem, custom system is called IceGate and port has a port community system. The, both, the two systems don't talk to each other. There's no message exchange. So how do we become completely paperless? The third problem is the, the awareness, the capacity building and the training for the staff who is going to use the system. Just again, a small example I'll give. When I was speaking to somebody in the in the customs, so I asked them, okay, now you have system, why is it still you're still asking for hard copies? They said, if I have hard copies, I can clear 200. Just an, I'm just giving a number. If I use hard copies and if I get hard copies, I can clear 200 bill of entries. If I have to use my digital system, I'll be able to clear only 100. It, it's also the speed and, and you're used to that kind of a system. So it's going to take time to transition to a completely, which we sometimes miss on. We just create a system. Okay, the system is available. Please use it. That, that's the, the, so so we, we sometimes uh, reduce the value of that investment that we have done in terms of money and time to create a particular system. So that's some that's with the digital infrastructure that that that's still lacking. There needs to be some in-depth understanding, and all stakeholder stakeholders need to be coordinated, and then a particular system needs to be developed. So we're making systems in isolation. So when we look at it at a regional level, so all the countries need to be together to build one platform where we can talk to each other through systems. Again, a small example, Petropol. There is a, a truck comes from Bangladesh, it has three colored slips, paper slips, which he gives one at the gate, one at the warehouse, one at the custom. And that's so these are just small examples that that came immediately to my head so we need to work on these we need to address these uh, challenges in our digital infrastructure and third is the non tariff barriers i mean that's there's there's a lot of talk rajan was talking about there was almost we had almost reached uh, an agreement i mean we I mean, this is a problem that we have been having forever with not only with BIMSTEC, I mean, South Asia or any other region or a bilateral agreement or a regional agreement or a sub BBIN, we're almost there, but we are not there. So we need to pace up these uh, agreements and, and uh, uh, the, the, the political will needs to be executed in a proper way, which takes care of trade and economy of the region. And that's something which is very, very important. And uh, when we talk of uh, BIMSTEC, so we're also thinking, looking at a free trade agreement at some point. And uh, I think uh, I would I would request and urge all the everyone uh, in the in, in all these countries that let's learn from our mistakes. In in BIMSTEC, we have countries from South Asia, we have country from ASEAN. 
so what mistakes did we make in our in our previous free regional free trade agreements so so can we cover those up we were not, we could not we could not give our countries requisite infrastructure and connectivity we could not in south asia at least we could not do that we could not give them a conducive regulatory framework because we we bombarded our exporters and importers with non tariff barriers we could not and and the most important point is we could not separate politics and economics so so can we learn from the mistakes that we have we could we have done in the past or something better we could have done in the past to take those learning that's what life is all about it's about learning from the past so can we learn from the past and take this bimstech to and and take those learnings for this regional grouping which has a lot of potential because when we talk of regional value chain one rule that we all need to remember my my customer in the us or europe or uk wherever he is for him it's not only the supplier who has to be in place the suppliers of the suppliers all supplier also need to be in place that's what regional value chain is all about so so a, a supplier might be in thailand or bangladesh but his suppliers somebody is in pakistan somebody is in india somebody is in sri lanka they also need to be in place so so let's let's work towards to that environment and and let's hope that we are able to induce some sort of a regional cooperation within south asia thanks to bimstech because of bimstech can we get some benefits of existing cooperation that we have because i could see some of the value chains which already exist between in india and pakistan i mean because i have been working a lot on india and pakistan there are already value chains which exist in sports goods we have a value chain uh, again a small example post covid i mean it's, again covid has shown us some realignments and covid has given us some hopes also post covid the hand sanitizers which were uh, going to pakistan from china in in huge quantities as soon as the covid the corona virus started in china the the trade of hand sanitizers from china to pakistan considerably reduced and it started from india obviously the trade between india and pakistan is suspended it started going from india to the uae and uae to pakistan so trade finds its 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 own ways I mean, you you just give them the conducive environment just give them that environment the ecosystem you don't need to follow up with the traders they will find their own way they know how to earn money so 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 the basic thing here is that we need to create that conducive environment conducive ecosystem on three pillars infrastructure for connectivity which is road and maritime and inland waterways definitely and trade facilitation which would also talk about digitization and 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 cooperation at the customs level the clearance level the the the, the agencies who are doing testing that's again a big challenge today i mean and, and if i have to import something from bangladesh uh, so it it takes me 15 days for fssi to clear it so so these are some of the low hanging uh, opportunities which we need to address and uh, create and create a create a system where we could uh, solve this problem and ensure a better cooperation in trade in in this upcoming region of bimstech thank you everyone i hope i was within my limit uh, chair thank you so much thank you thank you afak that was very uh, helpful and i uh, come back to this important role you talked about this ecosystem and the elements around it uh, which was infrastructure trade facilitation and the desire also for cooperation and these other conditions so you brought some other very nice uh, points to the party um, the floor is now open for questions and thank you so much to our speakers for being very concise and uh, clear uh, so please put your uh, comments or questions in the chat box um, while uh, you all are gathering your thoughts um, i may ask um, each of the speakers a question and give them maybe a minute to answer um, to tadateru uh, you know what about this issue of trust uh, building uh, to encourage uh, regional cooperation uh, particularly in the context of bimstech and also uh, from adb's experience do you hold your breath about ppps uh, 
for infrastructure projects, public-private sector partnerships? Please, Dr. Teru, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, on, on the trust building, uh, we are now, uh, pre uh, you know, uh, I think for the, uh, may maybe I think for the, uh, I may talk about the trust building between uh, one possible area is the between BIMSTEC and, uh, and uh, GMS. And uh, I think, uh, I think uh, we are now uh, planning some informal uh, discussion between BIMSTEC and uh, uh, and um, I think uh, it was it the GMS or ASEAN, uh, but anyway, I think we are planning such a dialogue. So, so I hope uh, that will uh, contribute to some uh, trust uh, building uh, exercise. And uh, on the PPP, definitely, I think government cannot finance uh, all the uh, uh, required resources. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we are supporting BIMSTEC uh, with the TA resources. And uh, one, one of the topic is how to finance uh, the, the inf uh, connectivity investment. Uh, as you know, I think uh, uh, BIMSTEC is now finalizing the master plan for connectivity. The next uh, uh, you know, challenge is how to finance uh, those uh, master plan. Uh, actually, the master plan is a list of uh, prioritized projects uh, so that the countries can uh, prioritize so that, uh, you know, each uh, they can have a project, uh, each uh, can have synergy effect each other. But uh, I think uh, financing is uh, one of the uh, challenge. So uh, there is a study uh, ongoing about the PPP. Uh, let me stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Tada Teru. Um, uh, to, to Ratna, um, I have a bit of a provocative question, Ratna, given your uh, experience as being a trade negotiator in the BIMSTEC context. Um, should BIMSTEC countries just give up on the BIMSTEC FTA and just do bilaterals or just go try to go straight to RCEP? Uh, do you have a view on this? Uh, RCEP is very interesting. If India has backed out, I don't know any other country will be getting into, though it's uh, not as open-ended as CPTPP is. Uh, but yes, uh, you know, there are a larger challenge and uh, you have also written extensively. The plethora and what we call is a noodle bowl. Uh, already, if you look from the Indian perspective, it has so many bilaterals. If you look from Sri Lankan context, it has uh, bilateral with India, it's negotiating with Bangladesh, it's negotiating with Thailand. Uh, in BIMSTEC, actually, see, there are a certain advantages in the bilateral context because your sensitivity is less, so perhaps you can have a higher level of ambition of tariff liberalization. But the regionalism or regional trading agreements bring more advantage because uh, you can then become a larger part of a regional supply chain which is the subject matter in debate here. Uh, uh, and uh, many solutions which you can uh, look at in the regional context. Unfortunately, you know, when you started, that was coming to my mind. I mean, when you were giving your introductory or, you know, the rest of the speech, you know, and you know better. Uh, if you look at ASEAN and if you look at SARC, the both dynamics are entirely different. Uh, even in the context of how countries think, um, and uh, if you see how the liberalization was done by ASEAN, even LDCs and other de developing countries, um, they were more, uh, you know, outward oriented. But in SARC, we uh, want more and more, but we are not willing to give. And that was one of the big challenge when we were negotiating the BIMSTEC agreement, because even countries like Myanmar was coming with a larger offer and in BIMSTEC countries were not in a position to, you know, uh, put a discipline on substantial trade as both the, the volume of trade and the number of tariff lines. And ultimately it went down to the number of tariff lines. And I did analysis uh, uh, even a couple of years ago and 70 to 80% of what is being traded among the countries is in the negative list. I mean, it was surprising to find even some of the items which have been liberalized in SAFTA are in the Wimstead negative list of a country. Um, uh, so, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, 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 uh, I, I really feel uh, 
there is something and so uh, i think what needs to be done is to what you started with and uh, what my other fellow panel speakers have said to have a confidence building measure uh, going into ec way i mean of course we talk much about non tariff measures but if the intention is we can cooperate and you don't know but no country is asking you to lower or remove your non tariff barriers why between some country which has some technology research and laboratory why cannot then why can they not provide technical assistance um, uh, to other countries or um, ldcs or even island countries um uh, I, i know uh, long ago uh, you know india and sri lanka were negotiating a mutual recognition agreement and uh, sri lanka granted uh, on certain products uh, to india but indian authorities were not willing to uh, give that now those kind of uh, aberrations really create uh, problem and uh, and you may have everything on board you may liberalize everything but at an operational level as afaq was also saying the mindset of people uh, who are maintaining the borders uh, customs uh, various agencies which are looking into standards and conformity assessment you cannot change and that need to be changed so operative operational level problems are already there and perhaps some of the solutions could come when you go into more faceless paperless edi exchange building infrastructure uh, uh, perhaps yes but otherwise it's a very uh, difficult question which you don't even jagdis bhagwati was able to answer so you put me into a very difficult question but thank you very much yeah, uh, difficult uh, clever people get difficult questions sorry um Uh, i have a question for uh, famida another difficult question huh? how do you um, avoid this green protectionism becoming yet another ntb you know uh, while reaping the opportunities of green trade in a, in a practical sense how would you go about that uh thank you very much this is also a very you know tricky question because it goes both ways um because on the one hand the um awareness among uh, people particularly the consumers of the developed countries um is increasing and also the as a result the companies are under pressure to provide uh, them uh, a sustainably you know produced or manufactured product so this is a um and also there is a also a high premium for that uh, so the obviously the buyers or the importers uh they would uh, you know in order to keep their customers attracted towards them uh this is an important strategy on the other hand also it, it you know just going by the importance of the nature uh or the environmental you know sustainability point of view it's very important that the way we live the way we uh, conduct our economic activities for long term sustainability for intergenerational equity this is very important the way you know we have lived so far you know centuries uh, you know uh, in the past that's not going to uh, you know uh, going to sustain and uh, if you may remember that uh, just uh, i think a month or so ago the you know the human development in uh, report by the undp which has been you know uh published that has reiterated the need for taking into consideration the planetary pressures which uh, is being which are being put on the you know the planet and which is going to have a long term impact so that's very very important but on the other hand as you have mentioned and we all know that this might be used as a tool for a, a, another non tariff barrier this is a uh, you know uh, something which we have to be you know, very careful uh, of because this is another you know way of manipulating or putting pressure on the uh, you know countries which export so i think you know while we would be mindful of the uh, environment but also we all have to be uh, mindful of the um, the the trade uh, impeding measure so this is uh, again depends on the way we negotiate this is a you know like all other ntbs uh, another one which has to be dealt uh, carefully uh, because we cannot really uh, avoid the responsibility of protecting our world but again as i said that this is 
we again have to be very careful that whether it is imposed on a weaker you know, trade partner or not. So is it being applied across the border um, uh, equally? That's important because some countries, in, as you know, that the big debate uh, in the world is that uh, regarding uh, who emits how much and whether how it would be measured, whether it would be on the basis of per capita or uh, you know, GDP or all these things. So there are a lot of debates on this, but the you know, basic thing is that we have to be you know, mindful of how we are producing and how we are making investment and how we are exporting as well. And COVID-19 has, COVID has, I think, uh, uh, put this realization uh, high into our minds. Thank you very much. Uh, to Shalkat, uh, you know, you talked a lot about these uh, export processing, special economic zones. And my question really is, uh, would you advocate uh, investment targeting and uh, selective incentives to attract FDI or would you have a more market-based approach? Uh, thank you. Is, is Shaukat with us? Uh, Shaukata, uh, are you here? Yes, I'm there, I'm there. I yeah, forgot to switch you. on, I yeah. forgot to switch on, sorry. The, uh, I was muted. Now, uh, uh, to Ganesh's question, I would go towards a more uh, target-oriented uh, SEZ foreign direct investment than the market-oriented way, because uh, to develop Mm, uh, value chains in the region, what would be required is to push, because we have left it, we had left it to the market to operate and find regional value chains, regional value chains have not come into being. Now, post-COVID situation, post-crisis situation, if we still continue to leave it to the market for investment to move in, I think uh, it will not move in the direction to build up regional value chains. Uh, we need to, we have pockets of uh, skin hide in the leather sector. Let me give you an example. Skin hide uh, in different parts of the Bimstech region. We have uh, leather parts and uh, accessories being done in different parts of the region and final footwear in some parts of the region, but it's not regionally integrated. We have gems in certain parts of the region, for instance, in Sri Lanka, in Nepal, in some parts of India, in Thailand, but we don't have a uh, gems and jewelry regional value chain. We, we independently produce gems, we independently produce jewelry, but uh, targeted FDIs don't go from one part of the country, one part of the region to the other part of the region. So I think some targeted movement is required so that the region is uh, integrated. And there might be uh, other complementary measures that are required, uh, but that will actually facilitate uh, um, regional, stronger regional value chains and resilience uh, in times of crisis. Uh, thank you, Shaukat. Uh, to Subhashini, um, you know, as you rightly pointed out, this uh, post-COVID world is going to have very tough FDI competition, right? Uh, particularly in the JVC sense. Um, and how, can countries really differentiate themselves? I mean, is it just enough to, you know, put in a better investment climate and, uh, uh, you know, do trade facilitation and things like that? Is that enough? I mean, particularly countries that have an image problem, you know, um, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh may uh, be considered places where are not conducive for large scale investment. How would you go about building such an image? Thank you. Yes, I think this is something some of the private sector companies frequently say, especially when their companies get into high tech or high skilled sectors, they are saying no matter how good their product is, when they go out, not just abroad, but even in Sri Lanka, the fact made in Sri Lanka becomes a problem as opposed to a 
lower quality product that may be made in Japan or Germany because Japan and Germany has a brand reputation where they are thought to be very high in technical excellence. So any product from them has much better consumer acceptance than even if you produce a higher quality product um, in certain, uh, your, you, it is a tougher market to penetrate because your country has a brand problem. Uh, and Dr. Vignard, it is not a problem just in, in abroad. And there are many companies in Sri Lanka that, tell, that has told me that they had to actually say, you know, hide the fact that they were made in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka and get some of their downscale supplies to say this is you know done with Japanese technology or German technology and try to sell it because people like the product they buy it they like it and they know it's good quality but the moment they say it's made in Sri Lanka they will ask isn't there anything that is from Japan or Germany or you know so Europe so there is definitely an image problem that countries like us have to overcome when we get into the high tech and high skill sector in our own countries to get greater consumer acceptance. And, and, and also, also um, when we sell abroad, they say when you want to negotiate contracts or negotiate, find buyers abroad, that they do frequently have problems. So, so one of the companies said the way they have actually overcome is they have bought shell companies or cars, you know, sh smaller companies in European countries or in other countries so that they actually do the marketing from there. So, so, you know, so you, they had to hide the fact that they were made in Sri Lanka. And, uh, and this is definitely a significant problem that manufacturing sector has to overcome. Somehow I feel information technology and other sectors, maybe because of India, we have, we have somehow created a reputation and it is not as difficult uh, to say that we do have IT skills and IT experts in our region. But in the manufacturing sector, uh, I wish I had an easier answer uh, because, uh, because I think it's not as easy to overcome the branding issue. We have been discussing about country branding a lot, but country branding is multifaceted and it's not just uh, about high skills and, and um, high technology sector. And um, maybe one way is uh, actually getting uh, your education system quite up there and having, uh, I always feel if you a country has few universities up in the Asian uh, top 100 list in Asia, that is one way one, a country can actually overcome that brand problem. So the fact that most of our higher education institutes are ranked so low in the world, uh, you know, those are definitely problems that we need to think about. I think we have discussed for long this um, a bit of a superfluous branding without really addressing the internal factors that drive that image, including uh, upgrading and improving our higher education sector. Uh, so maybe uh, something to think about. Thank you. Thank you, that's uh, very useful. Um, now, uh, last to Afak, um, you know, I'm very sympathetic to your uh, question of an ecosystem for cooperation is needed. Uh, how? How much, you know, given regional institutions are so small and fragmented and there's this trust deficit, how, how would you go about building this cooperation infrastructure? The theoretical construct, I understand, it's the practical side of this, you know, how do you, or is one just a dreamer and one should just dream on and try to encourage? No, please, it's an honest question, please. I, I agree with you. I mean, our previous examples of regional cooperation are not that great. So we don't have good memories of re regional cooperation or integration. But uh, I think uh, when it comes to BIMSTEC, there is, there is still some hope given the mix of countries that we have. I mean, if we focus on infrastructure building, that should be the first step. I mean, building infrastructure across a region should be the priority. And we need to identify the low hanging fruits rather than going thinking that okay we'll build something in a year or two years we need to identify the low hanging fruits low hanging projects for connectivity building connect like india bangladesh can we build some good connectivity we have icps already in place can we improve the infrastructure at that icps 
we have uh, Kolkata port. There are already identified problems. What are the problems and challenges in Kolkata port? Can we work on those? All the issues have already been identified. It's not that we need to go again to the ground, identify the challenges, identify the problems, and then work on them. Sometimes there are very, very simple solutions to the problems, but we try to make it complicated by defining the problem in, in, in a particular way. There are very simple, lots of time we already have solution like digitization. When we talk, we have been talking about digitization quite a bit today. Most of the platforms are already available. The systems have been made. It's just the implementation has not been done in a more practical or a user friendly way. I mean, we again, an example from India, we have something called a port community system, which is one of one of the latest multi-stakeholder single single digital platform but we don't have users on it because there are a few few features which are which, which were missing in it i mean which could be worked out and it could be made user friendly where you could have all the stakeholders of port ecosystem on one digital platform so so the solutions are not that difficult i'm i'm, I'm obviously excluding the politics part of it because with, with SARC, we had this bad experience because of the politics part of it. But ASEAN, 20% or 25% regional trade, it makes relatively much better than what we have in SARC. If we can replicate the kind of relationship we had in ASEAN countries, we can still do better. Let's not get demotivated by SARC. SARC is a SAC is where it is because of the political issues. I mean, and let's be, I mean, if you look at SAC within SAC, we have two, one group, which is BBIN, which is doing amazing together trading. Nepal is doing most of its trade with India or India, Bangladesh trade is doing really well. So it, it's, it's not that let's not get demotivated by SAC. There are opportunities and low, I, I would again go, if we have small, small connectivity projects and work on target-based building up those connectivity projects and simultaneously building digital infrastructure, I think we would be in a better position where we were in SAC. I mean, what were the challenges in SAC? Politics, politics, and politics. I mean, let's, if, even if our connectivity was not, uh, was not great, it was because of politics. So thank so, you, yeah, thank, so, you thank, thank you, very very useful. Now there are a, a couple of questions in the chat box. Um, I'll just read them out. We have about five minutes, so maybe a minute uh, from. Uh, uh, I maybe think, one uh, Dr. Ganeshan, I think we can also uh, get until six ten if needed. So it's fine. Okay, so we can go a little longer. So yeah. thank you so much. Um, so there is a question: What is the current uh, trade facilitation status? Of the measures between India and Bangladesh. I wonder if a colleague from India or Bangladesh uh, might pick that up. What's the current status of trade facilitation measures between India and Bangladesh? Anybody? Yeah, I, I may give it a try. Or Rajan, if Rajan is also, I think Rajan is also. So why don't you both have a go? You have keep it brief. Yeah, please, please speak, Afka. Yeah. So I think uh, with between India and Bangladesh, um, there are two key uh, elements that we need to work on. And, and some work has already been done. Is One is on the ICP Petra poll. So working towards facilitation through the ICP Petra poll. And uh, there have been issues which have already been identified. There is a, there is, I mean, there is a lack of uh, coordination in the sense that the handling capacity from the Bangladesh side is, is much lesser than the capacity that Indian side could send. So that creates a delay and congestion from the Indian side. So there have been discussions going on for the Petropol part, and there is a discussion happening at the government level to ease out trade through the Petropol. I think that is one which is happening. There has been some improvement on the inland waterways treaties between India and Bangladesh, which is also going to help in the northeastern region for trade through the northeastern region. And uh, Kolkata port and Chittagong port connectivity. I mean, the, again, I, I've already spoken about the issues at the Kolkata. So from the Indian side, uh, there is uh, something called a National Trade Facilitation Action Plan, which is developed uh, at the from the Indian side. And 
these these points have been taken care in that and these points are part of that national trade facilitation action plan petropol as well as the connectivity through maritime connectivity through the eastern ports um, uh, rajan i mean i think you can speak uh, no uh, afkar you you said i mean what i was to respond is uh, there is no such bilateral trade facilitation mechanism per se which is formal between india and bangladesh both countries do recognize that there are many measures which need to be taken but still as i was mentioning and um, non tariff measures when bangladesh wants to export his surface or seasonal or something or even textile it is a problem uh, infrastructural bottlenecks afak has already said uh, but in the global context both of them are the members and signatory and have ratified the wto trade facilitation agreement within that there are many issues uh, which they are tackling at a multilateral level which will uh, have implications on the bilateral trade too like advanced ruling and other things and as afak has said um, uh, india has already ice gate and automated custom system so for every export and import entry and uh, documentation you can do online bangladesh is trying bangladesh has i'm told um, is now exceeding to the scap paperless trade uh, uh you know uh, the framework agreement uh but between them uh, you know the bridging that link so you know uh, these ict connectivity remains in island india has within india that ict connectivity within the customs with bank with exporter and importer in bangladesh it has it own but india and bangladesh do not have so those kind of um, arrangements unless Uh, in terms of connectivity cross country connectivity happen the real trade facilitation measures would be difficult thank you thank you very much um, we have a question um, also about uh, leadership uh, from member countries to bring all the countries on board for regional agreements so we had to broadly read the question um, uh, subhashni do you have any thought on this or tada teru leadership political leadership to try to get and also that answers this question about uh, you know the indo pak and other problems uh, what do you okay. feel beyond yes. economics go ahead <laughs> so on leadership i will add. i think sadly i don't i think it's not just at regional level sometimes we may question it at um, local level as well uh, in in steering our economies in the right path uh, and and that leadership has been problematic not just with one government i think with successive governments in the region uh, getting steering the economies uh, in the right path has been uh, challenging so maybe Uh, the leadership is 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 definitely a problem but also at the regional level i think south asia has been allowing domestic politics to trump um, foreign policy right so so actually they use foreign policy uh, to get uh, uh, you know uh, win votes at home rather than actually to manage uh, you know uh, the regional politics for their their political interests at home uh, it has been at least uh, from sri lanka and i know uh, we've been one of the problems we've been having with india is also how we play each other um, for our own political interest uh, by our politicians to win votes and i i have i don't know when it'll come to an end because obviously for politicians coming to power and staying in power has been the biggest motivation in the in the profession so so whatever mechanism that works for them they have been using and unfortunately it has not been in the interest of the countries and the people living in the countries but uh, but it's it's a very i i i am not a political expert to be able to actually give an easy answer to that thank you uh, tada teru any any thought on this issue of leadership uh, i don't want to put you in a difficult position but it's a very important question given your experience of trying to get regional organizations together please yeah uh, actually i wanted to add uh, on your previous question about india bangladesh uh, may i sure 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 yeah uh on the bangladesh india uh you know trade facilitation i think uh, uh one of the area that the adb is now focusing on is the tran uh you know transit uh uh through bangladesh for indian cargo especially going to the northeastern region and um, we are currently preparing a program loan uh to address uh, to 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 facilitate uh, to introduce such a transit uh, uh, arrangement 
and uh, most likely we will facilitate we will you know uh, support the bangladesh to introduce uh, ects and uh, to to make it happen so that is one uh, on the bbin motor vehicle agreement is also you know bangladesh uh, india is a part of that and uh, i understand uh, uh, India, Bangladesh are very keen, but uh, Bangladesh doesn't want to go bilaterally with uh, India. And uh, by the way, uh, as we know, I think uh, Bhutan uh, has decided uh, not to join uh, for the uh, first. Uh, they may come, come back later. So as of now, it is uh, BIN, so Bangladesh, India, Nepal. But, uh, you know, since ADB is supporting uh, this BBIN, uh, we also had some workshop in Nepal, but still I think Nepal is a bit reluctant to join. Uh, uh, I, I see that the, uh, the reason behind is that um, uh, Nepal transport operators are a little bit reluctant because they are afraid of uh, competition between the Indian trucks. So uh, I think that is the one, uh, a part of the problem that uh, BBIN is moving forward. Uh, ADB is currently supporting the logistics policy preparation for Nepal. And uh, we are trying to use this opportunity uh, to, to include in the policy to, to strengthen the transport sector, especially the trucking industry in Nepal so that uh, they feel comfortable accepting the BBIN MBA. Thank you very much. Uh, we just have, uh, Famida, I'm just going to get you into the conversation if, if you don't mind um, on this question of leadership. How, how do we get leadership for regional cooperation in this BIMSTEC region and, and what incentives might countries have to do this? Maybe, maybe Famida is, is Famida, are you there still or? Dr. Famida, she, uh, are you there? She, she, may, she may have moved away from the computer. Um, in, in that case, I'm going to uh, wrap up if you don't mind. Uh, uh, so we started this uh, session uh, with really uh, uh, three uh, questions. Uh, the first was what was the outlook for uh, regional cooperation in this BIMSTEC region? And, I think there was broad agreement that there are some opportunities that may come up uh, for trade and also value chains. And uh, part of this uh, came from uh, talking about uh, supply chains leaving China um, and there being opportunities for others. Another part of this came from green uh, trade and production, uh, which was very interesting. There were services which were mentioned and, and many others. So there are new and old ways of trading, uh, which may be there for um, BIMSTEC countries. And um, somebody had observed in that regard that JVCs are a big potential opportunity, um, uh, particularly the regional side, and neither of these are much present. And small firms in uh, this uh, sub-region are also not much present in uh, this kind of trading or in any kind of trade. So um, very important uh, outlook uh, with lots of opportunity. Uh, in terms of the barriers, uh, which was the second area we talked a lot about, uh, we talked about uh, non-tariff barriers being one uh, important area. We talked about trade costs and trade facilitation broadly being another. Uh, we talked about disruptive technology uh, being yet another. Uh, we talked about the lack of targeting and uh, special economic zones. Uh, we talked also about, uh, you know, more esoteric questions about an ecosystem at the level of regional institutions. Um, and we talked also about this important question of, 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 of geopolitics and tensions between countries. Uh, and uh, also the need, uh, you know, to, to, to uh, kind of th think of ways forward, which was the third area. And um, to me, I think this question of, uh, you know, building trust among countries through better understanding of mutual gains from regional cooperation has to be one area. And I think the pandemic um, has brought that out uh, where we uh, need, you know, much closer cooperation on the health uh, uh, process in uh, the Beamstech region. I mean, it was, I think, uh, Famida, who talked about the health ministers 
another colleague who, who said they really hadn't uh, met very much. Uh, no, that was Pats Ratna as well. And um, so I think we need to look at areas of common interest, disasters, health, uh, maybe important areas uh, to try to emphasize in addition to economics and uh, things of that type. And then over time uh, to look for, you know, a better investment uh, between this subregion, but also encouraging outside investors to come in, uh, improving trade costs, um, and then perhaps going towards cross-regional um, FTAs, but with a lot of emphasis on adjustment assistance, because I think that's going to be terribly important if we're going to uh, get regional cooperation going. Uh, so in conclusion, I think there is uh, interesting things that can be eventually taken to the BIMSTEC summit. Uh, from this on uh, trade and regional cooperation. Um, and I think we had a very uh, fruitful session. We should give all our panel of, a hand. Uh, it was a terrific session and, and thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Chair. And thank you, thanks to the panelists. Uh, uh, the session has been very insightful, I must say. And with this, uh, I would like to welcome you all to the next sessions because we still have two more sessions, uh, two more paper presentation session. At 6.30, we have a paper presentation session on trade. And at 7.30, we have another session on regional cooperation. Uh, so you, you are all cordially welcome to the next sessions. Thank you all.